City of Your Lives movie for sure came out. Mm -hmm. I know when they were filming it, there was trouble in, 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 in releasing it and even on set. Mm -hmm. What do you? What can you tell me about that? What do you know about it? Well, first, I have to admit, I have never seen it. Um, so I don't, I can't really give a constructive criticism okay. of, of the show. I've never watched it. I do know the premise that it's based on is all bullshit and, and lies. It should be called Movie of Lies uh, because I know the premise that it's built on. You know, when you're, pri when you're co-star of the, of the film, your secondary figure, one of your lead characters has to be a fictional character that should in and of itself tell you that there's probably some problems with the creative truth of this show. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I haven't seen it, can't criticize it, but I know it's based on Russell Poole's theories. You know, I understand there's a, sh a scene in there where he has a shootout with Rafael Perez. Right. Right? That just goes to show you how fictional parts of that movie became. And so you have to ask yourself, well, if there's so many fictional elements, when does the whole movie actually become fictional? So that never happened, the shooting with Perez? And of course not. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, listen, I get a ton of shit for interviewing you. Mm -hmm. If I could interview Gene, if I could interview Car Phil Carson, they're welcome mm -hmm. to come on my platform. Mm -hmm. I've reached out to Phil Carson, the Dossier podcast, mm -hmm. no word back. Okay. Uh, uh, Gene is definitely not going to sit down with me. Remember when mm -hmm. I, I first reached out to, to someone in a go-between, he, he tried to charge me money, like six, five hundred dollars for like five minutes or something. I'm not gonna pay someone to talk to me. <laughs> like I don't know what whether I don't know what the reason is. Do you want to solve the case, or are you just trying to get paid from this? I don't get it. You're, I think you're saying that if you can develop a platform, I'm assuming this is where you're going with it. Is that you know if there's opportunities to have these discussions? Well, of course. Um, I'm, I'm, I have no apprehension about these discussions as long as they're done uh, respectfully, professionally, and with some type of control. Because otherwise, you just end up on a, you know, a daytime talk show where people are screaming at each other. Exactly. I get a bunch of people saying, "Hey, these are uh, the Greg King doing his, uh, his lies. Why are you citing McGreg? This and that." When Valletta is supporting the City of Lies movies, mm -hmm. but come to find out, I think they have a, a executive producer credit, so they're. They're, they're gaining as f financially from that movie, so, I mean. Listen, I've said this before and I'll say it again. You're never gonna catch me criticizing Valletta Wallace for the decision she makes. Um, she's been through a lot and has been dragged in different directions. And so, um, you know, God bless her and her soul. And, and if, if she saw this as a opportunity to, um, to provide more attention to the case or whatever it is. I don't know what her thought process and motive is. But yeah, when you're the executive producer of a production, you want it to do well, obviously. Um, and again, unless she had creative control over the editing, she doesn't know exactly how this movie is going to be, you know, what the uh, full narrative is going to be. She's got her scenes and she's got her um, financial interests potentially, but the, the end product may not have been something that she had control over. Um, so I don't know how she feels about it, um, but I can tell you this, I think she knows that the premise of all of that is bullshit because they spent a lot of time and money trying to prove it and it fell apart at the seams at every turn. Mm. You know, so unless Valletta Wallace was a little bit naive as to what was going on with her case and her attorneys, which is possible because that happens. Attorneys are playing their games right. and you don't report all that back to your clients necessarily. Um, you know, she's just along for the ride, so to speak. And, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of time and effort and honest people um, were involved in trying to solve that. And it's not the, it's not, it's not the people that, um, have been falsely portrayed that uh, were responsible for the, you know, for the ultimate death of her son. Right. She did, for the audience, she did say unsolved is 98% per, true. So again, um, you know, you've got to take it all with a grain of salt. Um, I thought when I had my rapport with her and we discussed things, I thought that she was, uh, you know, relatively convinced 
that it was authentic and genuine and and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, who knows? Well, I mean, you know, your family's case and, and using his theory to support it and then it being dismissed. Oh, no, the case was not dismissed. It was a mistrial. Huge difference. A federal judge caught the LAPD hiding evidence that linked Mac and Perez to Christopher's murder and declared a mistrial. Now, here's the kicker. The city of LA, they reopened the investigation because as long as it's an ongoing investigation, that evidence stays locked away in the dark. So we cannot sue LAPD because they are investigating the case. Okay, so I think there's three things to unpack there. A is that there was at one point in time a mistrial. That was prior to the reinvestigation, the, the task force that I was involved in. So there was a point where a mistrial was declared. It was, you know, the, the case was refiled against the city of LA. So A, that's point one. There was truth to the fact there was a, a mistrial. It ultimately did get dismissed um, in 2009. Um, after it had worked its way through the courts for several more years, it was ultimately dismissed. Um, so it really has to do with like, what is the time reference that they're, you know, that, that they're referring to here? Two, the suggestion that you can't sue the LAPD because there's an ongoing investigation is just ludicrous. You can sue anybody for anything about any time. And having an ongoing investigation has nothing to prevent that, doesn't do anything to prevent that from happening. And then of Johnny Depp's statement is like, well, that evidence stays locked away forever, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not the way it worked. When we were doing our investigation, we were under court order that anything that we developed during our investigation having to do with Mac Perez or any other accused party, we were mandated to turn that information over. So if we went out and interviewed somebody and they said, hey, uh, um, we think that uh, you know, Rafael Perez was there, we think that David Mack had done this. We had to write in our report and then provide that to the plaintiff's attorneys. They got anything having to do with these allegations. That was part of our mandate. However, if we interviewed people and they said, man, uh, yeah, it is there. And I think, you know, Jack Smith, you know, provided the car. We don't give them that because that information has nothing to do with the lawsuit. So we had to go through a process of providing discovery for anything that was germane to the lawsuit. But anything that was irrelevant to the lawsuit, we had no obligation to turn that over. Just like when we interview Teresa Swan, and she says, I was involved, Suge hired a gangster, I transferred the money. That we don't have to share because it's not germane to the lawsuit of whether or not LAPD officers were involved or not. It, is, it basically exonerates them anyways. But to see the differences, these are some of the legal challenges that we had to abide by and, and deal with throughout the investigation. So that scene's got some truth to it, but also a lot of shit's misrepresented.